Okay, so we just talked about Rawlsian fairness, but now we're going to talk about fairness more generally. Um, Rawlsian, the Rawlsian standard is not the only way of thinking about fairness. Um, and this is important because lots of economists have not been considering fairness in these models because it's, it's tricky to model fairness mathematically. Um, and so often there's this over-reliance on the Pareto standard. Um, but it's, it's not the greatest. And so there's been a, a move in the past decade or so um, where economists are figuring out that um, most people don't actually care about Pareto efficiency because that's weird. Um, people care more about fairness. And so there's this tweet here by Andrew Baker, who's a, a PhD student at this point in, in law and economics. Um, and he says here, like, Pareto efficiency is one of those things that economists love that the general population doesn't actually value. Nobody cares about this. It's a strange standard. Um, instead, fairness matters. And there, there is a way to incorporate it into game theory models and into other economic models. This article from 1993 um, argued that you should incorporate fairness into game theory. And when you're figuring out payoffs, um, include the benefit that you get from fair outcomes is like one of the numbers in the in the box and kind of add that to the the general payoffs and and incorporate that into the model that often doesn't happen um, because how do you quantify fairness points in addition to happiness points and it, it gets really complicated um, but it is something that you should consider um, and it get it it will improve um, your economic models and improve your analysis if you can incorporate issues of fairness into it somehow. Um, and so what this, what this does is it creates this distinction between efficiency, which is the Pareto efficient world, um, where all you care about is consuming the most economic pie, um, the, the most benefit for everybody without hurting anybody else. That's this idea of fairness, this Pareto efficiency. Um, versus this idea of equity or fairness or justice, where instead of just saying, let's get the whole pie consumed, and if one of the farmers ends up with a whole bunch of uh, bonus points and profit because they cheat, oh well, good for them, they cheated, and we're consuming lots of economic pie, neat. Um, in this world of equity and fairness and justice, it actually matters who consumes how much of the pie. And you care about the allocations rather than just is stuff getting consumed, which poses kind of more difficult um, questions of how you decide um, how much of the pie people should get. And so one way of conceptualizing this, um, the difference between this idea of equality and fairness and um, justice, is this this meme here that you've probably seen on the internet before. It's, it's useful, but we'll talk in a minute how it's not actually the greatest. Um, so in this situation, this is equality land where everybody has a crate that they can stand on regardless of ability, regardless of situation. They just kind of all get a crate. And so it's great for these two people. It's not great for this little guy. And so that's sad. Um, in equity land, what you end up doing is providing support for people who need it the most. And so this is the allocate, like allocating goods in a way, not where you're just consuming the best, the most amount of economic pie. Um, but making it so that people who need stuff more get it. So if you look at these, these actual crates here, in this world, moving away from this allocation, taking away one of the boxes from somebody and giving it to somebody else, that is not Pareto efficient. You cannot move from this allocation to another allocation without hurting somebody. If you take this box away from this tall guy and give it to this person, that's going to hurt this person um, because it's not Pareto efficient. And so according to the laws of Pareto efficiency, you can't do that. In equity land, though, you want to be able to kind of redistribute these resources so the people who need it the most get the most. Um, so that's this equity land. Then you also have this, this idea of justice or liberation where instead of like reallocating these crates and stuff, just change the institutions that are restricting people from, um, from flourishing. Um, if there are barriers to, um, like if there's poverty and uh, it's really hard for people to get access to, to good food, you can provide them with extra support. So like give extra uh, SNAP benefits, give extra Medicaid and Medicare, um, extra boosts so that people can get access to things. Or in this liberation land, um, in the justice world, just get rid of all of the barriers for things. Um, um, one argument for socialized medicine or other things like that is um, it eliminates all the barriers and it just everybody can have access to medical care. Um, and it makes everybody better off instead of um, doing this weird rearrangement of resources um, 
to to either have equality where everybody kind of has a baseline level but not great versus equity where the poorest get the most support. Um, the issue with this though, and one common criticism of this graphic, um, is that it's it's useful. It's a memorable thing um, to think about, to think about this, this difference between equality and, equ and equity and liberation. The issue with it though, is that it implies that um, the inequities and the inequalities that we're trying to fix are either a choice or they're inherently biological. So here, um, the short guy is standing there um, by choice and is just naturally short and they stink at being tall, they can't see. And so it's kind of their own fault that they are there. Um, they should either grow taller, but they can't, or they could just move to somewhere else, or they could pay extra money to go stand in the, or to go sit in the stands. And so this graph, while it is memorable, it does kind of place the fault of, of the people who are disadvantaged by the system on them, on the people who are disadvantaged by the system, um, which isn't great. And I haven't found any alternative ways of looking at this um, that, that take that into account. I have seen versions of this where instead of boxes, there's kind of holes where this person is stuck in this hole and this per they're all the same height. Um, but this person's stuck in one hole, this person's stuck in a deeper hole. So that gets rid of the ability idea where there are inherent natural differences between people and some people are better at seizing economic, economic opportunities than others. Um, but then that also puts the blame on like, why are you standing in the hole? Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get out of the hole, which again, kind of places the blame on like them for being there in the first place. So if you can think of a cool graphic that incorporate, like that deals with, um, that doesn't imply that the differences here are based on ability 100% and choices 100% and doesn't place the blame on them, do it and you'll go super viral and be great. Um, but in the meantime, this is kind of what we have. Um, but the issue here is that um, if you blame the people themselves for not being successful instead of the structures, then you're placing the blame on the wrong place. And so there's this Buddhist monk here um, that has this memorable quote here, that like, when you plant lettuce, if it doesn't grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for the institutional and structural reasons for it not growing well. Um, it might need fertilizer, water, less sun, whatever. Um, but you don't blame the lettuce for not flourishing because it's just a, a lettuce seed um, and uh, like it's not its fault. And so that kind of goes back to this example here. You don't blame the short kid for not being able to see. Um, it's easy to blame him, just grow taller or move somewhere else, but um, it's not his fault. And so like instead of, of kind of trying to rearrange these things to improve equity, focusing on this liberation side here um, gets rid of kind of all of those, those issues and gets rid of kind of the structural reasons for why there's a lack of flourishing, the structural reasons for poverty, um, the structural reasons for um, all sorts of things. And so that's like, we care about these institutional ideas rather than kind of the personal ideas in, in economics and policy here, okay? So the reason this is important is because um, different societies have different ideas of what fairness is and what equity is and what justice looks like. Um, and they have different sets of um, institutional barriers and different ways of getting rid of those institutional barriers. And so it's, it's very important to pay attention to the context of, of, of these different societies and how they structure these ideas of fairness. And so one way people have tried to study this is by creating this game, um, kind of like a game theory game. You read about it in the core reading here, this ultimatum game, where you essentially have two people, you give one person $100, and then that person has to make an offer to the other person, um, and they have to split the money somehow. And so they can say, I have $100, I'll keep 50, I'll give 50 to you. And as long as the other person agrees on the split, then they both get to keep the money. If the other person rejects the split, then nobody gets the money. And so what's really interesting about this ultimatum game is it reveals all sorts of notions of fairness. Um, the most rational and efficient outcome for both parties is to just accept any offer. If one person gets the hundred dollars and then turns to person number two and says, I will give you $1, that's one free dollar for the person. Um, and so the rational thing to do is just to take the dollar. But that doesn't happen very often because it feels wrong. 
it feels unjust. Even though it's just like free money and it had nothing to do with them, we still have this, this notion of fairness embedded into transactions. And we want um, to kind of feel um, some notion of fairness and justice. And so what happens, is this doesn't often happen. If the person with the $100 decides to offer one, they'll often get rejected. Um, and so what generally happens in these experiments that the econ economists have done is they found that most offerers will give like 40%, 30%, sometimes 50%, and that will be the offer because they want to make it more fair um, because they don't want to be rejected by the person. They want to keep their, their split. Um, and so that, that this is really interesting finding. And so in your reading, you saw this graph here where they did this ultimatum game in two different contexts. They did um, a whole bunch of students at Emory, and then they did a whole bunch of farmers in some villages in Kenya. And they found all sorts of weird cultural differences here. So if you look at the x-axis here, this is the fraction of the pie that was offered by the proposer to the responder. And so if, if they, um, if, we had $100 that the proposer had, they had to offer some amount to the responder. And what they found is those who offered 50% of the pie, um, so like 50 bucks to the, to the responder, um, in both Kenya and at Emory, 100% of the responder would accept. Um, like everybody would do that. 50% was kind of this universal thing. Everybody loved it. Um, the, the responder never demanded more. They never said, you must give me 70% of your earnings. Um, they were fine with 50 and that was just universally beloved. Um, as you started shrinking this though, what ends up happening is at Emory, um, if students, if students who got the money, the proposers offered 40%, most of the acceptors would take it. If they offered 30%, most of them would take it. Even if they offered 10%, more than 50% of the receivers would still take it because that's kind of the rational economist view of the world. Um, that's just free money. And so sure, the other person gets like $90, but I get $10, cool. And so that, that's kind of the split that you see in the Emory world. What's really fascinating, though, is that with these Kenyans, um, with the Kenyan farmers, they saw it like at 50 and 40 percent, that was fine. Um, they basically all accepted it. But as the, the offer started decreasing, especially as it got down to 20 and 10 percent, um, the responder would reject it very often. Um, you couldn't ever do like it was very rare to be able to get a 10% for the for person number two and have person number one keep 90%. That was often rejected. And so what the, the, the researchers here um, concluded from this experiment is that the Kenyan farmers were more likely to reject unfair outcomes, um, which potentially reflected that they valued fairness more in transactions. Um, these cold-hearted Emory students who don't care about fairness and just wanted the money regardless of how it was split, that was kind of a reflection of their values. Um, while these, these farmers here value fairness more. Um, they were willing to reject these offers because it didn't feel fair. Um, and so there's, there's greater value on that. Um, and so that raises this question of what even counts as fair? How do you measure that? Um, you have this idea of um, substantive fairness which is what does the allocation look like? Um, where in the, in the case of this ultimatum game, that's where you're looking at the exact percentages. You wanna see if something is substantively fair. If it's 50-50, that's pretty substantially fair, substantively fair. If you have like a 10%, 90% split, that doesn't feel very substantively fair. Um, and so it's more of just kind of the of balancing the inequalities here. Um, another type of fairness is this, this idea of procedural fairness where we like to consider the situations that create um, um, different allocations. And so this is where we look at how the allocation got to be. Um, so if you look at procedural fairness with this ultimatum game, um, what you're going to ask yourself is why did person one get the initial offer? Is that okay that they got the $100 and then they have to split? That seems like a weird structure. Um, it doesn't feel very fair because they get all the benefit and we have to just kind of live off of um, their generosity if we want to get anything downstream. 
And so with this procedural fairness, one way to gauge if an allocation is good is to look at the institutional structures that generate it. Are the processes that create um, wealth fair? Are, do people have equal access to be able to earn money or to um, get benefits? Um, and if not, if there's issues with the processes and with the institutions, then um, it's not going to feel fair. Um, a third standard of fairness is this veil of ignorance fairness or the Rawlsian fairness. Um, which is different from the other two, but that's just the idea of um, if you had to set the policy or the allocation not knowing what would happen in the future, does it look okay? And so if we think about this ultimatum game, if you decide not knowing if you're person one or person two, what the allocation is, you're probably not going to choose a 90-10 split because you could end up with the 10% if you don't know which person you're going to be. And so you're most likely going to choose a 50-50 split because um, then you're going to benefit regardless of which person you end up becoming. Um, and so these are three different ways of looking at, at, at fairness and judging fairness. And in your problem sets um, and in your exams, you'll, you'll take examples of allocations of, of wealth or of different policies, and you'll be able to evaluate them based on substantive fairness and procedural fairness and this Rawlsian fairness here. It gives kind of a vocabulary for measuring fairness here. So how do we decide what is fair? Why was it that the, the people in Kenya had one definition of fairness while the, the cold-hearted Emory students had their own definition of fairness? Um, and ultimately, this, this decision is based on social and cultural norms. Um, this is why I had you read this fascinating article about the role of luck in um, social safety net structure. Um, so this, this graph is fascinating here. So the x-axis here is the percentage of people in the population that believes that luck determines your income um, versus hard work. And so if you're, if you're down in this land here, like the U.S. here, only 30% of the country believes that luck determines your income. Instead, we believe that hard work and grit and determination and bootstraps, etc., that determines your income. And if you're not rich um, and not successful, it's not because you're unlucky, it's because you're not working hard enough. And that's just how we have it here in the United States. It's the American dream. Work hard and you can succeed. Um, other countries, though, if you look at Denmark, for instance, 60% of survey respondents in Denmark said that luck determines your income, um, which is a really high percent. So there, if you are unsuccessful, it's not because you're lazy. It's because you're just facing bad luck and sucks for you. Let's help you. Um, and so what you, we have is along the x-axis is the percentage of, of people who believe in luck versus hard work. And most of these European countries have high percentages of, of luck like Germany, Italy, Spain, Norway, Uruguay, down in Latin America, everybody kind of believes in luck. Versus here, this is the hard work world. We have Canada and the US and Dominican Republic and Peru. Um, but where this, where this gets really interesting is the size of the social safety nets in these different countries and how much money is spent on um, social programs like um, medical assistance and uh, unemployment assistance and general poverty assistance. And there's this fascinating correlation here between luck or belief in luck and size of social safety nets. Um, what they find is countries like Denmark and the Netherlands and Belgium and Sweden, where people believe that if you're not being successful, it's not because it's your fault, it's just because of bad luck, there's a bigger social safety net to support you. Um, while if you're in Dominican Republic or Peru or the U.S., there's a much smaller social safety net because it's your own fault if you're not successful because of belief in luck here. And so that, that's generally what they find here. Um, they tie it to historical trends here where there's like wealth and class differences um, because in Europe, um, lots of the wealth in Europe has been concentrated in wealthy families since like the 1100s. And so they're successful because the people just happen to be born into um, rich royal families and that's how success has worked and everybody else wasn't born there. Um, and so as a result, there's kind of this more, um, more of a push towards luck being the explanatory factor for success. Um, but then they argue that this idea of the invisible hand um, helps um, help like Americans are able to to make it on their own because of this this notion of 
of the free market and having everything. Um, if you work hard, you can succeed. Um, we just have like this, uh, this notion of the self-made man is very much an American icon. And so as a result, we have very low social spending. And so this idea of fairness is very closely linked to how we perceive success and kind of the social and cultural norms we have here. Um, there's another um, article I didn't have you read, but it, it finds very similar things here. What they do here is they measure um, the, the factors that determine how much somebody supports having a strong welfare state. And so this graph here shows different regression coefficients from a statistical model that shows what kind of beliefs increase or decrease the support for a strong social safety net. So they find that if somebody believes that bad luck causes poverty, they are very likely to support um, having a strong welfare state. And that's kind of a strong coefficient. They're way more likely to do that. Um, if you believe that luck causes wealth, again, you're going to support a stronger welfare state. Um, like luck and effort cause wealth. There's the effort part. Um, if you believe that, then um, you're going to support more safety net. This um, lack of luck and effort, again, strong social safety net. What gets really fascinating, though, is when you look over here at the negative factors that influence support for a safety net. If you never worry about bills, or if you're a white male who thinks that there's lots of opportunity in the United States, and if you're rich, then you're not going to support a social safety net. You don't think that people should have it um, because your personal background is influencing your opinions on how public money should be spent, and it influences um, how how you think uh, money should be allocated to the poor. Um, in part because if you're down in this world where you're a white male who never worries about bills and you're rich, um, you're going to think that it's because you worked hard to get there. And there's an element of that. But if you believe that bad luck causes poverty, and down here, like there's kind of this disconnect here, which is super fascinating. Um, and so, again, like support for public spending, support for all of this stuff, and support for notions of fairness are very much tied to personal experiences and social norms and social constructs of, of what constitutes success. And so it's, it's really hard, again, to make these cross-cultural comparisons because what counts as fair in Denmark um, or fair in Finland is not the same as what counts as fair in the United States um, to different sections of the population, which makes it really hard to justify policies on on the grounds of fairness because fairness is all over the map. But you also have to think about this idea of fairness to make sure that um, people are still getting access to policies. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a tricky balance, something you might want to explore in your weekly reports um, to, to see how this all works in real life. Um, so finally, one really good example, an applied example of this idea of fairness here and how it conflicts with efficiency often is this idea of international trade. So in problem set one, and in um, the second session, we talked about this idea of comparative advantage and absolute advantage, where if you want to have a good, efficient economic outcome, it's good to have one country specialize in something and another country specialize in something else, and then kind of drop the manufacture of other things in those countries. And so we use the example of Italy and Mexico, where Italy should focus on olive oils and Mexico should focus on avocados. And therefore, that's going to maximize the economic pie for everybody that is Pareto efficient. Everybody's better off. The issue with that, though, is if you're an olive oil farmer in Mexico, but the national economic policy now says drop all olive oil and switch completely to avocado, what do you do? Um, you've suddenly lost your job. You've suddenly lost the ability to, uh, to grow and sell olive oil because you've lost the support for that. You've lost the market for that. All your olive oil jobs went to Italy. And so that's an issue. Um, in the readings for this session, you um, listened to a podcast about retraining programs that were created in the wake of NAFTA, um, this North American Free Trade Agreement in the 90s, because lots of workers in the United States began to lose their jobs because um, industries were outsourced to different countries because of this idea of international trade, um, where international trade is wildly efficient. It's great to have other countries specialize in specific things because it makes cheaper iPhones, it makes cheaper computers, it makes cheaper furniture, it makes cheaper food. Um, there's more economic benefit for everybody. But it hurts people because it is not necessarily just or fair. 
Um, and so what policymakers often try to do is they try to fill those gaps, um, those fairness gaps with other programs to make it so that if you lose your job, um, you can do something else to kind of get back on track um, and still earn some sort of living. And so in the podcast episode that you listened to, you, you heard about different retraining programs and how, how variable they are in their success. Um, it's, it's really hard. If you're a, a young miner, um, a coal miner who your mine gets shut down and you're like 20, you probably have lots of econo economic opportunities. You have the ability to switch careers relatively quick. But if you're like 63 and your mine closes and you have to go learn how to code in JavaScript and take a, a two year workshop to do that, by the time you're done, you're 65 and your retirement age and who's going to want to hire you? And that's a problem. Um, and so different countries have been grappling with this in different ways, um, trying to get it so that it's they can have a strong safety net for these people who are kind of left behind by this, this idea of international trade and growing the economic pie, which is great, but also focusing on this this justice and this fairness and making, making it so people aren't left behind, um, which is an issue. And it's hard and there's no right way to do it. And uh, it's again, something you should explore in your uh, weekly report if you feel so inclined, how to square this idea of efficiency and fairness. It's, it's a tricky tightrope to walk.